Welcome to another episode of A Couple with a Conversationalist. My name is Con and I am the conversationalist. And yes, I have my latte in tow as always. This Today, I'm joined by literary royalty. My guest on this episode is Australia's best-selling author and regenerative agriculturalist, Rachel Treasure. Rachel has been dubbed an agricultural activist, farm feminist, and literary pioneer and has worked as a rural journalist, radio broadcaster, Jillaroo, professional wool classer. The list goes on, but the one that got my attention was the truffle sniffer dog handler. Rachel sparked a publishing boom in 2002 when her first novel, Jillaroo, woke the world up to contemporary women's stories beyond the city lights. Jillaroo has become an iconic work of contemporary fiction changing the face of Australian publishing and kick-starting a boom of rural women's fiction. Her eighth novel, Milking Time, is due for release in May 2024. Rachel is also co-founder of Ripple Farm Landscape Healing Hub, a 100-acre regenerative farm in southern Tasmania that showcases natural sequence farming, soil health principles, ecological restoration, and holistic farming. Welcome, Rachel. Oh, thank you, Con. That's amazing. What an intro. And uh, the only royalty we Tassie people have is probably Queen Mary. So, <laughs> but, <laughs> but if I'm, I'm not Tassie royalty nor literary royalty, and as, as mm. I was saying to you earlier when we were, you know, before we came on the show here, I just said I'm Tassie as. And, <laughs> So Tassie as is a good way to be. You're you're very very humble, Rachel. Very very humble. <laughs> uh, as I said to you earlier, uh, when I invited you on the program, uh, I, I had an idea of who you are, but not to the depth of of what you've what your achievements are. And uh, and and you're very very humble. Uh, and I'm certainly humbled to have you on my program. Hey, Rachel, where are we finding you this morning? Uh, I'm at uh, a little place called Orielton. And Orielton is in southern Tassie, and I'm you know, in a house with oh, I don't know how many working dogs around me outside, and hopefully none of them will will bark. <laughs> <laughs> and um, yeah, so house and um, ten acres of property, and I've got mm. some sheep in the paddock there uh, outside, and and run livestock sort of here, there, and everywhere as a almost like a grazing service. Okay. Yeah. A- yeah. And tell me about your background, like. Were you born in Tassie? Uh, country is that through your blood? It were, t- tell me a little bit about Rachel's background. Uh, well, I'm a fifth generation Tasmanian, and I came from both sides of the fence. There was the convict side, and then I there was the commandant side. And also, there's um, pages in history that never got written. So there's there's areas of our family tree that w- are untraceable. For example, we only found out that we had convict. Um, blood in us in 1992 and my grandmother wouldn't speak of it after that so (laughs) yes and I grew up um, a southern gal um, and my family lived from the land not on the land but from the land so it was a lifestyle of growing our own food bottling our own fruit um, wherever there's excess you preserve Um, yeah I I was taught to um, butcher meat very at a very young age catch fish um shoot for rabbits so we we lived a really humble existence from the land within within the bush um, of tassie and then uh, i went to what we call the mainland when i was (laughs) the (laughs) big smoke the big smoke (laughs) yeah i'd never said i didn't see a traffic jam until i was 11 years of age and i went to melbourne so and we my i remember this was back in the 70s and my brother and i were just in, in you know we're in awe of a traffic jam but now sadly we've got them every day here in tassie but anyway i digress which you'll find con i do in in having a conversation digress um, away <laughs> Yeah, so basically I fell in love with bushland of Tassie and food and agriculture. And my granny was uh, Joan Wise. She was a writer in the 1950s and published in the Bulletin magazine with similar stories about uh, that I write about women mm. in landscape. Yeah, so so I had that farming background along with um, Gran's legacy of being a published author. Mm. 
uh, telling uh, speaking of Gran, uh, that's something that I'll get into. I'm very, very fascinated by that. As I said in the introduction, you you described as or, or you've been spoken about as an agricultural activist, a farm feminist, and a literary pioneer. How does that sit with Rachel? Makes me sound like I need a camel and a thing of water to keep me going. <laughs> no, it, it 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 sounds like a, well, it, that's really um, that that makes my well, it doesn't inflate my ego, but it makes me almost sort of shrink within because that to be Tasmanian and put your head above the parapet. <laughs> Mm. Um, you don't. The tall poppy syndrome down here is is um, vastly uh, alive and well. But you know, speaking of poppies, that's one of the main crops that we grow down here in Tassie is the opium poppy. We've been doing that since about the nineties, and I just understand that feminism is um, a word that divides. So what I wanted to do through my books is bring what I call the brotherhood of kind men and the wise women into the space of agriculture because what we are doing in the farming system is insane and somebody has to name it up and to name up what we're doing in our food system that poisons soil, water, air, which is what we've been doing since uh, post-war period in the 40s, Mm. Um, Yeah, someone has to kind of wake up people who are eating to understand that these systems aren't, really improving on a, on the larger platform globally, but there's a grassroots revolution that's happening in the regenerative and holistic and natural sequence farming space that I'm very much a part of. And story is the most perfect vehicle mm-hmm. to get that across because that's why I think it's a pioneering uh, backlist because not only have I stepped into being a voice for contemporary rural women, it's not all about um, you know, us in the kitchen baking. It, it is about us in the paddock imparting wisdom with low-stress stock handling and insisting that we have better, kinder ways for animals and for vegetables and fruit. Yeah, so there's there's layers to that um, labelling, I guess, that, that others have given me. Mm. But, again, given you but you're worthy of them, I mean, at the end of the day, Activism, and we spoke about this briefly. You know, feminism divides just the the, the connotation behind it, uh, and activism is probably not far behind as well. You know, somebody is an activist. You know, they're disruptive, they're chaotic, there, but that's not really what you're about in terms of your, an agricultural activist. It's I'm going to suggest that it's more about enlightening and raising a level of awareness to the populace, is that a fair summation? That is so intuitive of you, Con, because uh, I agree, activism, you know, energy begets energy and if you're putting an angry energy into something to counter something that you're angry about, you're only fueling that. Mm. And so what uh, I remember writing, I I, I once cleaned um, units, you know, toilets and stairwells and car parks in in inner city Melbourne because when you're trying to be a novelist, so for six weeks I was in Port Melbourne cleaning these really fancy apartments and I imagined in my author brain people people that they drive out with their BMWs, they wouldn't even say hello if you're vacuuming on the stairwell and I'd think, oh, you know, it's okay, it's cool because I'm absorbing all of this. So I wrote a beautiful short story called Evie's Garden Dreaming and it's about a little old lady that's been moved by her family off her farm in the outskirts of Melbourne and the family are developing that farm into suburbs, you know, non-eco-friendly suburbs, and the grandmother is in the units and she dreams up what those units could be where the swimming pool is filled with trout, they've got milking cows on the wasteland, every single garden space is utilised for, for food, she brings chooks in and every resident supplies food scraps for those chooks and so they share meals around the swimming pool and it's a showcase. Um, and there's a young gardener there who's he's an activist. He's, you know, protesting logging. He's protesting offshore frack, you know, um, gas offshore. He's protesting and active. And Evie, in her wisdom, shows him that he's best to lead forward with light. And mm-hmm. so... 
so so that young man helps her. He's the gardener at the facility, and he helps her realize this um, vision in the in the short story. Um, so I've been, and the, I wrote that way back in the nineties. So I. And and interestingly, we'll get on to it, my latest novel later, I'm sure, Milking mm. Time. But it's that's exactly the same sentiment, Con, that activism and disrupting other people's lives doesn't is not fruitful. We have to really collaborate, not mm. clash. Yeah. I like that. Collaborate, not clash. <clears throat> I'll write that down because I'll forget. <clears throat> Excuse me. Collaborate, not clash. <clears throat> Speaking of jobs, uh, and uh, we also read that you've, you, <laughs> I was reading the list and I'm going, you can't make this stuff up. <laughs> like you, you cannot make this stuff up. <clears throat> uh, professional wool classer, veterinary nurse, stock camp cook, high country cattle drover, truffle sniffer, dog handler. How do we... Like you don't get on seek and go uh, uh, truffle <laughs> sniffer dog handler wanted. Like, how do these jobs? Where did how did you fall into them? Oh, <laughs> I wasn't. I didn't fall. I was very deliberate. So I had a very conservative family, and they wanted me to go to university. Mm. So as soon as the school bell rang, I just knew I wanted to write and work with my um, horse and dog. Uh, horses and dogs and so I went to a place in the highlands of Tassie called Ooze which is it's Scottish so it's O-U-S-E but it that we used to have postcards in the local store saying there's more than moose in Ooze and <laughs> like <laughs> <it> was, <laughs> but basically there was a pub so that's more than moose um no but Ooze was a great spot and the the my boss was he was one of um people might have heard of um Pat Pirelli and Monty Roberts, they're the horse whisperer people. Mm. And my boss was one of the first Pirelli natural horsemanship um, well, um, facilitators. And so I learned stock handling and how to care for land, uh, with, you know, land care in mind from a very young age at Gilla, uh, as a Gillaroo. And I just knew I never wanted a nine-to-five life ever mm. because if you're an author, you can't just – I mean, for me, I love to live these experiences, learn about them, study them, and then write them. So I guess the dog handling skills came from, um, I, I mean, I, I studied. I studied agriculture and saw that mm. it led you down a world of um, oh, corporate and chemical. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, and then I studied <clears throat> journalism as well, um, and journalism took me to the region. So I was able to... Um, work part-time as a freelance and then do all these other amazing jobs. Um, yeah, and the Truffle sniff, Sniffer Dog Handler, that was a Tasmanian company that was setting up for the first time. So I was one of the five women. We were the first in Australia to ever handle dogs. Wow. And we were trained by um, a, a drug squad um, dog trainer. Um, yeah, a, and I had a Springer Spaniel called Tiny and um we would harvest during winter time in ta in Tassie, and there's nothing like knowing you're fully alive when it's a frosty morning. You're on hunt for truffles, which you are literally flying to a yacht for Princess Mary when she was a princess. That was what one of our truffles wow. went to Princess Mary on a yacht somewhere. Um, but you would be you'd have your nose jammed in the dirt because the people think the dogs find them. Mm. It's like seeking treasure. No, no pun with my name intended, <laughs> but, but you're following this invisible seam of perfume in the mm. soil. So whilst I had my nose jammed in soils, I was going to different properties and you'd see where that applied chemicals and then the other trufferies, trufferies, if you want to say it with a beautiful <laughs> French accent. French accent. Yeah, we are not Tasmanian to a truffery. Um, so <laughs> we're in the truffery. And and I was noticing the different dynamics of soil and fungi and, mm. and nematodes, all the little unseen things. Um, so that that job brought me very close to that. And I, I did that while my baby's a little um to supplement my writing income in the winter. Yeah. It was over about seven years. Best job in the world. absolutely <laughs> fascinating. Absolutely fascinating. You mentioned earlier about your your grand 
uh, being a writer, I, I'm going to, I hate that word assume, but I'm going to assume that that had a fairly significant impact on you in terms of your wanting to be a writer or encouragement to be a writer. Is, is that is that fair? Yeah, absolutely. It's a good assumption, Con. <clears throat> Gran, Gran was, um, you know, she was a farmer's wife, but she was out milking cows and she's, mm. and, you know, just working in the hop fields of the Upper Derwent in, in Tassie, so picking hops. And also, you know, yeah, it's generationally she was from strong women and also um, on the, she was on the, um, you know, we would skin skin animals and utilise the skins and utilise the wool. So she had that same background. But her writing, uh, it, it set, she set off in the 50s um, but then had to sort of pull up to kind of raise children mm. and it re-emerged in the 70s. So I would see her clunking away on an old typewriter. She'd have a whiskey and a ciggy and then those manuscripts, <laughs> those manuscripts would come back as books. And so I just assumed that you know, to get published, you wrote a manuscript and you got published. But interestingly, I hadn't, I wasn't familiar with her 1950s work, but when the University of Tasmania wanted to compile a collection of Tasmanian short stories, the editor rang me and said, look, we're putting your story next to a lovely story about a woman who's the fur trapper. My book, uh, my short story was about a woman who was skinning rabbits. And so they said, oh, it's a lovely segue into this story that was written in 1950. When they went to research that author, they couldn't find much info on it, but they found out it was my grandmother and our voices across the decades, across time, across space oh, wow. were so similar, they dovetailed them together in the collection. You know, it was this incredible goosebump moment. Wow. Yeah, wow. So, and... And, you know, that 1950s story that she was writing about, it was a love triangle about a woman fur tracker, trapper who's unmarried and pregnant to a bloke and leading another bloke on. You know, it, and it was published in the 1950s Bulletin magazine, so which is, you know, in 1950s. So Gran was a bit of a rebel. Yeah. Um, Geez, in the 1950s, I, that would have raised a few eyebrows. Totally. I don't, yeah, I don't know how she got published really, to be honest, but she, she was amazing. And she would, she traveled in the fifties up to Arnhem land and studied indigenous culture at a time when we were being educated in Tasmania by our education department and government that um, the last Tasmanians, there were no more Tasmanian Aboriginals, which is a complete furphy, mm. but that's what, what our education system were portraying to us. But Gran was telling me dream time stories and showing me, about native gardens and how they how important they are for birds back in the 70s and you know she she traveled so widely and saw a lighthouse in the desert she was put on a pulley cart onto Tasman Island from a boat you know to see a lighthouse yeah, yeah, you know yeah. and couldn't couldn't get off Tasman Island's very remote very rough went and stayed with the lighthouse keeper and then wrote the children's book story called Trapped on Tasman because she was literally trapped, trapped on, on Tasman because she couldn't get off because of this funny pulley system that they'd get you on and off the rough coastline so amazing grandmother and very very lucky that um, I had her in my wow. DNA. I'll tell yeah. you, yeah, very, very mm. much so. I, I read, as a rural journalist, you saw an absence of contemporary women in the Australian narrative and resolved to write a bestseller about women in the rural world. Now, your books are fiction, but are they? who's the inspiration behind some of these books and the stories? Are there real people sort of in the in the background there or or is it so is it not a hundred percent fiction you know who, who, what are the inspirations here well I have to say firstly my imaginary friends that I walk around with who are in my <laughs> novels they're all their own entity they're really real in my head however I have based a lot of my novels on actual experience so for example um in The Cattleman's Daughter, it was a time when I was living in Gippsland and we were taking uh, cattle up to the Dargo High Plains and I would see how grazing 
done responsibly can maintain and restore a landscape. If it's done irresponsibly, it can destroy a landscape. But if you lock it up and leave it under a national parks regime, it decimates a landscape because you end up with a single species invading like blackberries. And so basically I was witness to that landscape being overtaken by blackberries, which the national parks would counter with sprays. And if you see most parks vehicles, they have spray rigs on the back of them, whereas I knew that grazing can restore landscape because we've changed it forever. We have to get our heads around how we've changed the landscape so much we can't just go back to where we were. So I wrote that in. I also experienced bushfire in that region and the terrifying elements of getting livestock out. I was pregnant with my second child at the time and we were trying to get our horses out of that region and make sure cattle were safe and it was terrifying. So I would weave that into my books. Um, But fiction's a really tricky thing in that people will read it and assume that the character is based on them. We, we such sort of, we filter with our own perceptions. Oh, yeah. And so I've had, I've had I've written some nasty characters in there and I've had a couple of old uncles or an ex-father-in-law saying, oh, why would you write about me? And <laughs> I, I can honestly say it was not about them, but they made it about them. <laughs> And I just, so I think they were cross with me from that day on and it wasn't at all about them. It was just about what I'd witnessed as a journalist going into these homes where you have these men that dominate and their properties look barren. You go through the garden gate and they've left the chemical drums behind the shed. You go through the garden gate and the woman's offering you homemade jam that she's grown and the garden is green and flourishing. So there's this element there of what I've witnessed and you weave it all in. Also agricultural pioneers who are pioneering things like natural sequence farming and pasture cropping where you never till the ground because ploughing, we know what's happened in Egypt, that's what ploughing's done. We're continuing to plough and lay the soil bare, which is just Mother Nature loads it. She's been sending us messages for hundreds of years to say she does not like ploughing. So people like Colin Sice, who has pioneered a way of getting your annual crops off, which are like your grains for your Mm. breads and so on, you don't have to use a plough anymore. He's pioneered that in his region in in New South Wales, near Mudgee. Um, So he's woven into the farmer's wife some of his ideology and practices. So it's gently getting these discoveries and changes in rural culture out there via story to mm. people who eat food because we all eat everyone food. Eats so we food. All, mm. everyone eats food con so yeah, this is eats. why I, yeah this is why i do what i do i'm, I'm fascinated you uh you know these um uncles and ex ex father-in-laws how very oh. presumptuous of them that they think that that you would base a character on them wow jeez i'd be going yeah. thanks rachel <laughs> I'm in a book. <laughs> well, there, there have been a couple of people that say, can I be in your next book or can you put my dog in there or my horse? So I'll name the dog or the horse their, their you know, yeah. little ba- fur baby. But I, in milking time, um, I've got this absolute cracker of a post mistress at our local town called Jane and she said, can I be in your book, Rachel? And so I, I literally have Jane from Aussie Post in my book. Yeah, so just – and it's a, it's hilarious what – Jane and the main character Connie Mulligan get up to with the other women of the town. It's it's yeah. I'm not going to tell you. It's an ancient practice, but it's revealed at the end. Oh, the okay. Well, we, yeah. and Aussie Post Jane is there, so I've given her her copy it's re- <laughs> <laughs> already. It's a signed copy, I hope. <laughs> oh, absolutely. With the the sticky notes in where it mentions Aussie Post Jane. Fantastic, yep. fantastic. <laughs> Speaking of. Tell us, tell us about Milking Time, uh, your eighth novel, which is due for release May uh, this year. And for all our uh, listeners and viewers, I'll put all the links to Rachel uh, in the in the show notes, so you can catch those. So tell us about Milking Time, Rachel. Well, where do without I start? giving without giving away that practice at the end, because we need people to buy the book. We do, we do. Oh, and it is priceless. It is absolutely priceless. <clears throat> anyway, so so Milking Time is the first novel that I've told from a first-person narrative. So Connie Mulligan, it's told from her perspective. We, we think, you know, as a reader, um, 
she is a quirky, interesting character. She's very complex. She's a fourth generation dairy farmer's daughter who um, she's caused a disgrace at university. She's sent home to the dairy farm. She's witnessing what's happening in her local town. People are getting sick. Um, the farmers are getting poorer. There's overseas buyers coming in. The supermarket systems are um, pushing food onto our plates. So uh, that that are you know bad for us, unhealthy. They look healthy on the outside, but Connie, because of her agricultural science study, ha- understands all of this. But she is she her her family run her down so much. You know, it's that it's that black sheep of the family mm. story. Um, yeah, and and it's it's about how she overcomes this upbringing where she's made to feel less and, you know, her mother's got her seeing a psychologist. Does she go on medication? Does she not? And it's not until some um, that some vegans roll into her little hunt and shoot and fish in town, the Happy Chappies, Vernon and Fenton, and they set up a cafe um, called the Happy Chappie Cafe and it's not until Connie meets them that they she starts to unpack the truth about food systems with those lads and with the um, the locals of the town, um, a series of events. She travels to Ireland, um, and that's where she discovers this ancient practice, and that's where she returns to Tassie, where I'm not going to tell you what happens. No, no, no. And however, I must say it's weaving in so much of my own experience um, into this novel, and what I clearly want to say to people who consume food. And yeah. it doesn't matter if you're a paleo, omnivore, vegan, vegetarian, carnivore, it does not matter. We have to have a living soil and love, not economics, love at the heart of our food systems. And so that's basically milking time in a nutshell. Mm. May 2024, look forward to that one, folks. Uh, just like uh, I could talk about this for, for days, but I just yeah. I, I, I really want to talk about some of your agri- agricultural uh, philosophies and views uh, about what's going on. And you mentioned it earlier about, you know, since the 1940s. But just on your literary prowesses, so I've, I've read here that um, you're obviously a best-selling author. Uh, you've written a screenplay, uh, which you self-published. But you've also entered the world of adult entertainment, Oh, that, yes. Adult that entertainment. One. Now, I, I saw that and I go, hang on a minute, this doesn't quite. And when I saw the name, like seriously, I've just, I've fallen on the floor. It's an adult colouring book called 50 Bales of Hay. Oh. <laughs> right. Okay. We'll, we'll wind how up does, there. How does this, how does how does one go from from literary prowesses, you know, sharing stories about the land, uh, getting on to uh, adult <laughs> colouring in books, Rachel? Well, in the words of um, Kath from Kath and Kim, it's Yuma Con. It's Yuma. <laughs> I'm using Yuma. Um, <laughs> okay, so let's wind back a bit. So. Oh. 50 Shades of Grey came out and I was at the post office again. I'm often at the post office. I was going to say there's, there's a common denominator here, the post office. Yeah. There. <laughs> and there's yeah. sort of the post mistresses. Yeah. Even I think Jane was still there way back in the day. They were all fanning themselves and talking about this Christian <laughs> whoever was in 50 Shades of Grey. And I thought, oh, God, I better jump on board and read this. And I, I couldn't get past the third chapter. I found it so demeaning and trying to, you know, women aspiring to, you know, I can crack a stock whip, but really, seriously, like the stock whips are meant to be functional. You know, it just, it did not sit well with me. And so I I went to my friend's, um, I think it was her 50th birthday and we were all sitting around a campfire and everyone said, you should write a book, you should write Fifty Shades of Grey. And then we came up with um, 50 bales of hay. So I wrote 12 short stories based on all the women who sat around that campfire. They said, oh, what about a bloke and a lady in a dam with a horse? And what about a bloke, you know, in a cattle crush? And for farmers who know what a cattle crush is, it's, it's not a love crush. It's, yeah, anyway, okay. it's, 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 it's friendly for cattle, trust yeah. me. It's if, Yeah, so 
So I wrote those uh, 12 stories, um, 50 Bars of Hay, just for a laugh and also to showcase that women and men can get it on. They don't have to be, you know, svelte and young. It was It's for women all shapes and sizes and so long as you have love and respect at the heart of it, it's we're good to go. Um, but then we had, we had a, a, a really serious drought in Tassie and the um, superannuation corporations were buying up land, raising the bush, like flattening the bush, yeah. putting in um, blue gum plantations. So our small communities were dying. Farmers were so down. So I, my friend who's an artist and I came up with 50 shades of, of grey no 50 no is I can't even think of it. it's right in the cupboard behind me um it's anyway that's the coloring in book you're talking about so it's a self-publish and you it, it's available on my website but we brought it in for our agricultural festival ag fest to cheer people up because we were so people were so run down and mm-hmm. decimated like every 10 days in Australia are farmer suicides I kid you not they're, they're the stats so, and it's be- not because we're, it's because of the chemicals they're using that impacts the blood brain barrier. It's because of the landscape they're walking onto. It's war like, it's a war zone. This is not on regenerative farms, mind you. Mm-hmm. Studies have shown that regenerative farmers have a happier outlook on life uh, because around them is green space and living things. Anyway, I digress to um, adults only colouring in books back again. <laughs> yeah, so, so I'd have women coming into our um, books marquee at this agricultural festival. No, men, sorry, coming in saying, my wife heard you on the radio and she wants two, please. <laughs> they're, all, they're very sheepish. Yeah, but <laughs> so off. Yeah, and I, again, it's. I think I'm not just an author. I'm an inquirer and a. I'm an artist, and yes, and things have to be fun. And and by making people laugh, you draw them in. Yeah, if I was saying chemical agriculture is bad, yeah. then that switches everybody off. You know, we we need to gently change these systems to something that works for everybody, mm. including soil microbes. There you go. Mm. 50 bales of hay. I love that. Yeah, and, that was, yeah. That's gold. Yes. <laughs> that is gold. Okay. Uh, let's, let's, um, let's get serious. <laughs> I'm not sure where to start here, but a, a good place I'm thinking here is uh, uh, your manifesto for a new path in agriculture down the dirt road. Tell me about that. Well, that book came about... Um, I have had a rugged history, let's just say, as a Tassie woman. Mm. Uh, Culturally, we were Mm. raised in my family that women were less. Um, I was witness to a marriage where, it, yeah, women were put up, shut up and put up, you know, put up with it, shut up, yeah. And stupid bloody woman, bloody woman drivers, you know, never mind I can back a trailer like you wouldn't believe. But I was, was, you know, raised with that. and um, I'd been interstate. I thought, oh, Tassie needs some new genetics. So I, I, I married a bloke from Gippsland, Victoria, um, bring some fresh genes into Tassie. And um, and I, I arrived on my father's farm. I'd always wanted to come back to this farm. When I was backpacking overseas, that's where my heart place was. I'd ridden my pony there. I'd, you know, been a – I was a runner, run, long, love run, running in the bushland, like long distance. And – um, and I came back and we expanded the farm, we changed systems um, to a point, um, and, but I was trying to change the blokes to a regenerative, holistic farming practice that I'd learnt from Colin Sites, who we spoke of earlier. He was mentoring me amongst other people. This is back in 2009 and I had two children. My eldest had a disability. She's got cerebral palsy and um, intellectual delays. Um, and I knew somehow that was linked with the agrochemicals that that I was I'd experienced in my first trimester of pregnancy. So I was really pushing manure uphill to get changes on the farm. And then you know something happened that broke the marriage. Um, and I went to my dad and said, "I have to leave. I will, you know, I have to leave the marriage." Mm-hmm. And he said, "Well, if you're going to." leave your husband and you don't sort it out you can't farm you're a woman he I'm keeping him on so he's he kept my 
uh, former husband on the farm and he's now wound up that farm in an estate since he's passed where I no longer access it. Um, so that was the um, genesis of Down the Dirt Roads, just for me to kind of unpack and understand how somebody who has the skills of farming and the vision of farming and um, everything that I'd worked for to be a farmer have land removed from my care. This isn't, I don't care about the economics of land, mm -hmm. but it's my spirit place. Yeah. So basically where I live, I can still see the mountain that I used to ride my pony up and run up and and my ex-husband is still there, still using chemical, still ploughing, um, and my children go there. So it, in a way it's, it's, it's one of those things that it, it can erode you inside. Mm. I've, the stress of it, I've already had um, breast cancer, so I'm recovering from that. I'm, uh, you know, a couple of years out of radiation and chemotherapy. But all these things just really seriously, Con, they just light you up to the important things, which is self, yeah, self love, inner self love, and it, it it's a, it really is a perfect foundation for me to write um, from a place of love, so that I can help other people that are going through similar. Um, hardships yeah wow very profound <clears throat> let's let's uh let's talk about uh agricultural practices uh and i certainly uh, I, I see what's as a big picture what's going on and and i want to go back to one of the things you said earlier uh, about how the agricultural practices you know started to to change in the 1940s uh, I'm going to suggest that those changes would have been um, exacerbated or amplified, but with uh, a need for feeding uh, more population, more profitability, uh, supermarkets later on. Is that is that fair? Yes, I think one of the the most important books of our time to read is Rachel Carson's The Silent Spring. Now, Rachel Carson was a biologist. She wrote that book in 1962. It was buried by the blokes um, fronting up the the chemical the the, yeah, the chemical industry. So, so basically, when the the war was finished. There was a byproduct. There were byproducts of war, and that's what agriculture is now currently based on. So the superphosphates that we had, mm -hmm. um, that were made to make bombs, the tractors that were tanks, um, the nerve gases, they have all become products that we utilise in food systems, um, and people are profiteering beyond belief. So if you read Rachel Carson's book that was buried in 1962, you will understand why our children are sick why our lands are dying, why we're having a climate crisis. The thing that's not changing is people's hunger for money. So when you learn natural sequence farming, which was started by Peter Andrews, he's been on Australian Stories a few times, people might have um, become familiar with him, that that wisdom has been taken up by his son and his grandson. And um, so Stuart and Megan Andrews and Hamish Andrews, they're, they're young bloke, he's in his 20s. So natural sequence farming showcases to us that we have drained our river system since settlement. We've drained our wetlands. We've laid our land bare. We And that natural sequence farming teaches us that the small water cycle Water vapour is the most important thing we need to pull out of the atm atmosphere, not carbon. So the, this, there's a myth around methane and farting cows. That's a closed liquid carbon cycle, whereas, um, whereas you know, factory emissions, radiant heat from urban areas, roofs, concrete, radiant heat from bare paddocks, um, that is contributing vastly to climate change and the solution is re-engaging those wetlands, river systems, small water cycles, which is just a plant, diverse plants covering landscape, whether it's urban or rural. However, you cannot monetize that. So there's this massive push for flawed science around carbon where we're all going to see a carbon tax. Farmers are already going, well, you know, 
we'll get paid for our carbon, but that's an admission to say that we have a carbon problem. We don't have a carbon problem. We have a water vapour problem. And once we fix that water vapour problem and re-enliven our soils, we pull all that carbon down into the soil and it remains there. If we pull carbon into trees, those trees can burn, which I've seen, those plantation trees that people mm. were investing in, that, that carbon gets released back into the atmosphere. But if we're replenishing our soils, our wetlands, our water systems and having green leafy plants in our systems year-round, we're pulling in so much water vapour and re, um, reigniting our local climates. It's up to our local climates. You can do it in your backyard, you know. If you're a hot con, do you go and stand under a green, leafy, beautiful, shady tree or a shed? Which would you prefer on a hot day, you know? It's the science is being skewed for monetization in agriculture. <clears throat> and, well, and milking milking time addresses this in a loving way. The problem that we all have is that since the dawn of time, money is the prime motivator. And as much as people like you uh, and I can stand on the rooftops and yell and scream in a loving way. Mm. It's all about money, and it, it's you know what what you what you're talking about absolutely makes sense because I've always been a cynic about this carbon thing. Like I'm thinking, hang on, a, a cow passing wind is a problem now. Like seriously, but again, you know, all, all policy it's all driven by money. Absolutely. The root, it, the root is the you can you can drill down you every at, right at the bottom is a dollar sign. And isn't it interesting culturally? Money is a figment of man's imagination. The thing that's really real is air, water, soil, and sunlight. So we have the sunlight by plants that invigorates the soil and it invigorates community. It's a very, very Western mindset that's sort of spreading around the globe in a poisonous way. And it, it is one of those things. The ancients knew it and that's part of what milking time is about. It's it's where the ancients knew to revere Mother Nature, that she's an intelligent system. She's vastly more intelligent than us. Oh. Um, and no no linear science can unpack that and yeah and and really realistically at the end of the day money is a figment of our imagination and the most important thing on this planet is planetary health and that generates community health and mindset health mm. so T tell me about i guess what you're doing at the moment in terms of what are your uh, agricultural practices your cattle practices just to shed some light for our, for our listeners in terms of what you do. Yeah. So basically, uh, if you, it, it's a, in a nutshell, we are partnering with Mother Nature. So we, as we talked about natural sequence farming, you understand those principles about harvesting sunlight and all the free elements of farming with sunlight, gravity, water. And then you, in, you, sort of overlay that over your landscape and your landscape is a, you have to have a whole catchment mindset mindset so you have to pull up and look from a bird's eye view what's happening to your land you can't just have a linear thought process it's a bit like having a being a novelist it's a similar kind of mindset so our animals they don't have um chemical inputs they are utilized as a tool um for improving landscape so they're moved like a grazing uh, like a African animals, before mankind, we had billions of ruminants on this earth, Bef you know, before mankind mm. overtook it. So, so again, we go back to the farting cows. So we, and we have diversity. So we let all plants grow. Weeds are not weeds. They are simply management indicators. So they're telling us where the management's gone wrong. But we have the type and the style of animal like we have uh, that handle weeds and those weeds are just succession plants. Once we get our management right um, and we rest the land, the different plants will come and that tells us what to do next. So we're actually listening to what M Mother Nature is telling us via plants. The byproduct of restoring landscape using grazing animals means we've got beautiful meat and fibre 
I'm um, a low stress stock handling practitioner, working dog trainer. So these animals are so chill. They're totally chill. So what I do is I, I'm a very small, small producer, but I sell my meat through Tasmanian Produce Collective, which is an online farmer's market. People shop for the fortnight and then they pick up at local hubs around the state. Um, it's a We're a supermarket food rebellion. So I am able to sell my meat, my sheep and cattle um, and wool through these channels that aren't the supermarket chain. However, it's getting increasingly difficult, Con, because just before Christmas our local abattoir closed, which was servicing small producers like me. And what the state government or what many governments have done, they've let overseas um, corporations come in, buy up the abattoir systems, then centralise it. So we've lost all our little sales sale yards where farmers used to have a social outlet. It's now I have to if I want to sell into a supermarket system, I have to truck my beloved animals to the centre of Tasmania and they could end up on a boat and be sent anywhere in Australia. And as a responsible animal um, carer, I am not prepared to do that. So therefore, by going to your local farmer's market, you are supporting the resurgence of local farm facilities. I knew the staff at the abattoir. I knew that they care for animals. We've got a pet goat as a result because the baby goat was was rescued. So we've mm. got Barbara Gordon, the goat. So these things are, are so key for us to understand that if you can go online and look at there's a Open F- Food Networks Australia, that you may have a hub near you in wherever you are in Australia, Open Food Networks and they're encouraging farmers to sell direct through their organisation. And if you can attend a farmer's market and ask questions. If you're at the supermarket, organics doesn't necessarily mean organics. No. Be- no. It's a scam. It's, n- it's, it's not come from the living soil. Yet I know one of the major players in our supermarkets, you can choose which one. because <laughs> um, There's not many. To- <laughs> no, <laughs> they're wanting to increase their organic um produce by 800 percent um 800 percent but i've seen those organic systems and if you buy lettuce from that farm it it's still as toxic as the lettuce that you get from a conventionally sprayed lettuce farm that literally have chemical sumps at the bottom of them where that where the catchment comes in yeah, it's beyond belief. I, it's in milking time in a very loving way. Wow. But what I've, yeah, I'm witness to it because these farms are neighbouring our farms that we're restoring using natural sequence farming principles and regenerative principles. Call it what you will, but it's basically partnering with Mother Nature and listening to her first and foremost. Organics, for me, and this is Con's soapbox, organics to me now in a supermarket is a label for additional margin that's all it is it's mm. all it is it's all we, it, they, they promote it as organic right so therefore we're going to charge you more but as you mm. said it's no better than the produce that you buy that is you know uh, conventional farming methods no yeah, and correct and it yeah it, it is one of those things where um it's labelling, um, but if you can, it's not from a living soil. So, and Connie Mulligan talks about it a lot. But the thing you can do at home, though, which is really cool, we did this at Ripple Farm Landscape Healing Hub. We have we have school students come in, and we did a blind carrot taste test. So we had a carrot from a home garden that's been biodynamically grown. We had organic far, supermarket carrots, um, and the kids would eat each carrot as a taste test and try and guess. And number one carrot, always the sweetest, always the most popular was the one grown in the living soil. So your taste buds um, will tell you, however, the rubbish that the the chemists know exactly how much sugar, fat and salt to put in food to get us addicted, that changes our microbiome in our gut. Our microbiome in our gut is actually nature and, as we said, nature's intelligent. That biome signals your brain to make those food choices again. So you get literally in this addictive food um, loop where your gut biome is saying, buy more of the crap, you know, buy more of the crap. And so you really need to pull back and be totally aware what 
what's in your baby food. They're, they're grooming babies to keep you in this, this sugar, fat, salt loop. Um, I sound like a conspiracy theorist, no. but I've actually I've done the science on this, and my my colleagues are scientists in this movement. I, I, Rachel, I absolutely concur with what you're saying. And I, personally, example my um, my partner uh, lives across the road from her parents, and um, her, her dad's uh, uh, European background, and they they grow everything from tomatoes to lettuce to cucumbers to if he's got the most magnificent grapes. But when his tomatoes are ripe, you could put a, one of his tomatoes and then a tomato from the supermarket and a person with no taste buds and blind would tell the difference. Yeah. His tomatoes, there is just, there is just this, this, this flavour, this the the juice that just it's just it's a it's a different it's a different tomato and then of course you know we're all suicidal when when he's got no tomatoes and the he's coming yes. and we have to we have to buy tomatoes from the supermarket oh. and you're going no oh god I got to eat this you know and everyone jokingly says well can you hurry up and make them grow like quicker <laughs> you know so it's just there's there's no there's absolutely no comparison between uh, produce that's you know grown in you know in someone's backyard. But I, I go back to what you said about you know what you talk about in in your book how it's done with love, and you know these people that are growing even in their own backyards in a very micro economic way, it's done with love. They yep. don't do it because they have to do it. They do it because they want to do it. They do it. It's 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 their soul. It's what they did, you know. And it's just you just can't compare the two. Yeah, we could go on for days. Uh, one thing I do. One thing I do want to raise, and I'd be interested in your perspective on this, uh, Rachel. The perception of uh, economics regards buying from a farmer's market where it's you know, ecologically friendly, ecologically, you know, it's not uh, pesticides and so on versus buying in a supermarket. People go, well, I can't afford to buy that stuff. Is is that is that real or is that just a bit of a story that we've been fed and is being propagated? Uh, I think it's... Uh, it it's it's a story. Uh, we with Tasmanian Produce Collective, we uh, we've been lucky enough to to have got some funding to have a coordinator, and she's done a lot of price comparisons between our um, Tas Produce. So she compares the price of bread, eggs, meat, cheeses, and they're all on a par. Sometimes we're even cheaper because I might have an excess of lemons in my garden and I look at my supply of food to people as something I do for love, you know, mm. so I am so I will deliver. My my lemons are much cheaper than the supermarket and they, they're, they're grown with so much love under the, the soil for them. So I think it is a little bit of a furphy. But the other thing is if you are buying nutrient-dense food, you don't need as much. You don't get hungry as quickly. And so what 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 the systems are set up on, we're paid per kilo as farmers and in the yield. Now, what needs to happen and what is happening with technology is they're coming up with devices that you can scan on your phone. You can tell how many nutrients, how nutrient-dense that particular apple is or how nutrient-dense um yeah, so some of the other products are, and so you we will come. There will come a point where people will be demanding that they need to know it's chemical free, it's not gene genetically modified, and that yeah, it it is it is packed full of nutrients. So, it, and I find I don't spontaneously buy when I'm on Tasmanian produce because I'm considered I'm doing an online order in my own time. I'm not being bombarded by marketers, so I'm not putting extra things in my trolley that I don't mm. really need. So it's a, it's another disciplinary way to keep your budget low as well. Mm. Mm. Rachel, it's been an absolute pleasure uh, chatting with you. Uh, as I said at the beginning, uh, I'm um, I knew who you were, but I didn't know who you were. If that makes sense, <laughs> uh, and Thanks. and it's been uh, it's been an absolute honour speaking to, uh, um, and I don't say this lightly, literally literary royalty. 
uh, and, and Australian. Um, I, I just want to digress for a moment. Uh, does the name Chettle ring a bell? Does does no? One of my no. best mates, one of my best mates, is a Tasmanian. Uh, oh. And and Wayne, if you're listening to this, a big shout out to Wayne and his beautiful wife Marie. Uh, Wayne's brother in the 19 early 70s, David Chettle, was ranked number two marathon runner in the world. Wow. Mm-hmm. Uh, I reckon they're from somewhere near Davenport, but I stand to be corrected. But anyway, I digress. I thought if if the name rang a bell, it would be it would be quite well, interesting. Normally, I'd say, "Oh yeah, he's my cousin." <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, but we have this interesting. <laughs> dish. He's a northerner. I'm a southerner. We, we're very parochial here. <laughs> I, g- I gathered that. I gathered that. Um, Rachel, again, it's been an absolute uh, a privilege, uh, and it's been so much fun. I thank you for your uh, for your time uh, coming onto the program, and I'm sure everybody will uh, will be highly entertained, and more importantly, informed and better for uh, for having listened to this program. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Con. I am the conversationalist, and until next time, bye for now. <laughs>